we continue with the theory of functions. Recall, a function, which we give a name f, say, this is going to be a mechanism that takes inputs, which we call x, produces outputs, which we call y. And then for notation, we would say this is f of x equal to y. We've looked at three ways to represent functions, and we'll review those quickly at the beginning here. We have functions given by rules, functions given by tables, functions given by ordered pairs, and in this part, we wanna work up to functions given by graphs. Okay, and of course, why would I want functions given by graphs? Well, out in the real world, if we wanna convey information, sometimes the best way to do that is visually. So rather than giving large aggregations of numbers in any of these forms. Now, let's start with a basic example. So let's suppose I have the function given by the rule, f of x equal to 3x minus 2. I'll pick a few points just to get values of this, and then we'll eventually work up to the graph. So if I put minus 2 in, wherever I see an x, I put a minus 2. So out comes y equal to minus 8. If we put 0 in, out comes minus 2. If I put 2 in, out comes a 4. Now, we could table these three points. So recall for the table, we'll have two columns, x and y. And then we just, each row gets one of the data points that we just found. Okay, and so they have also, the important here matters. Once we have that, we'll convert each row to an ordered pair. So x comma y, or input, and then output. So for the next step, we want to move this data up to a picture in the xy plane. And so the x and y here is supposed to be suggestive of that. Now, we need to remember, how do I plot points in the xy plane? Because we won't just have positive numbers on both parts. We may have negative numbers, and then we need to keep our bookkeeping straight. So recall, if I have x values, when they're negative, we move to the left from the origin, 0, 0. When they're positive, we move to the right. Then for the y values, if they're negative, we move down from the origin, 0, 0. If they're positive, we move up. And so for instance, with the points we've just found, okay, we'll go backwards. If I take 2 comma 4, so that's gonna be our x and y, then we're gonna go right two and up four. And so we start at the origin, go over two, go up four for this point here. For zero minus two, how do we translate? Well, the zero doesn't have a sign, so that says from the origin you just do nothing relative to which way you're moving, which direction you're using. So if I have a zero in for x, that means we don't do any right or left motion off of the origin. So we'll stay on the y-axis, and then we're gonna move down two. So that gives us this point here. Note, that's gonna be our y-intercept. Finally, we have minus two, minus eight, the way we translate this. That says we go left two, and then we're gonna go down eight. Okay, and so we go to the left by two, down eight, we get a point here. We connect the dots, and then we see that our function f of x equal to 3x minus 2 has as its graph a straight line. And then that's going to be something we get into in the next couple of sections. Let's try another example. So we'll use f of x minus 1 minus x squared. We'll need a little bit more detail here to get the shape. So I'm gonna go from minus two to two. We put our numbers in. So f of minus two, remember when I substitute minus two in, if I have a negative, I put it in parentheses so that way I don't lose signs. Then remember with PEMDAS, we're gonna do the exponent before we do the subtraction. So what do we get? We'll have one minus minus two squared, that's a one minus four is a minus three. And likewise, minus 1 to 0, 0 to 1, 1 to 0, and 2 to minus 3. 
We could skip the table and just go to order pairs. And so we translate minus two, minus three, that says left two, down three. Minus one, zero says left one, stay. Zero, one, be careful with this one. This says stay with respect to X and Y, then up one. One, zero, right one, stay. And then two, minus three, right two, down three. So we plot our points, and then we know what comes out is going to be a downward-facing parabola. And again, we'll see these later on. That's the mechanics for making a graph from a function. We now want to go in the other direction. We want to start with a graph. We want to know how do we know if this graph comes from a function, and if so, how do we extract information out of it? Now note, we only have one requirement to be a function, that each input x have only one output y. To see what goes wrong, let's consider what happens when we have two outputs. So if I have f of 2 equal to 1, f of 2 equal to 5, they translate into the points 2 comma 1, 2 comma 5. And if we plot those, we're going to get these points here, which live on the same vertical line. That's exactly what we check to see if a graph represents a function. We call this the vertical line test. So if a graph in the xy plane is cut by a vertical line in two or more points, then that graph does not represent a function. Okay, And going backwards is true also. If every vertical line cuts your graph in zero or one point, okay, it doesn't have to cut it at all, then that is the graph of a function. Let's look at examples. So here, we're just given graphs. There's no numerical data attached to these, at least not to the last one. So if I have an upward facing parabola, you can draw in all the vertical lines that you like. This is a function, okay? We have vertical lines cutting in exactly one place. If I put the parabola on its side, we draw in the vertical line of soap. It cuts in two points, which means automatically not a function. If we take this graph here, okay, so this has some bending in it, we note Vertical lines always cut in one point, so that is a function. This is worth noting, if we put in horizontal lines, they'll cut in more than two points or more in some places, but that's not gonna be a problem. And just be careful not to confuse vertical and horizontal. Finally, with a little bit of numbers in it, if I take the unit circle in the xy plane, so this has origin zero, zero, and radius one, this is not gonna be a function because the y-axis, okay, so the line we have it through the middle, it's gonna cut in two points, so not a function. If we wanna remind ourselves where that comes from, here I could just label the points zero comma one and zero comma minus one, and then here you'd see zero has two outputs, one and minus one, so not a function. Now, once we know we have a function, we want to be able to extract data from the graph. So two skills we want to develop. We want to be able to read data from points in the graph, and we want to be able to find the domain and range of the function. For the first part, let's consider the following graph of a function. So we see we pass the vertical line test here. Every vertical line cuts in either zero or one place. Cutting in zero is fine. Things we can ask, how about f of one, the value of f at one, f of three, and f of one and a half? Then going the other direction, I wanna know for what x does f of x equal to two? Now, as a first step, if you're not sure how to begin with these, you should just start labeling points on your graph. So, we think in terms of here, it's just gonna be thinking about going to the right and going up, so I'll have points at the ends of the segments, 0, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3, 2, 4, 3, 5, 2. Now, f of 1, we have an input of 1 here, which represents an x. So if I look at x 
on the x-axis, we go above and there's a point 1 comma 3. Okay, and here this has 1 as the input. So that means 3 is going to be the output, and so f of 1 is equal to 3. If I want f of 3, same idea. We know the input is 3, so that's going to be an x. I look for 3 on the x-axis. We look above, and there's the point 3 comma 2. Okay, so we have a 3 here, so that's x equal to 3 as our input. Output's going to be equal to 2, so we have f of 3 equal to 2. Now, what about f of 1 and a half? We go to 1 and a half on the x-axis, that's between 1 and 2, and if I look above or below, we're never going to have a point from the graph. So that means we haven't provided any data on what happens at x equal to 1 and a half, and so that means the best I can say is that's undefined. And so that means there is no point of the form on the graph 1 and a half comma y. If we want to go in the other direction, so I want to know what are all the x such that f of x is equal to 2. Well, let's interpret. This is saying, find me all the inputs x such that output 2 comes out. Output 2 means we have y equal to 2. And in terms of the picture, y represents height. So I want to know what are the points on the graph that have height equal to 2. Well, if we draw in the horizontal line at height equal to 2, we're going to hit three points. We have 0, 2, 3, 2, and 5, 2. Note here the y values are all equal to 2, so that checks out. And we only want the x part, so our answer would be x equal to 0, 3, and 5. Finally, we come to domain and range. Now, the domain and range summarize all the x and y values that actually get used by your function. So for domain, that's just going to be all inputs used or all x used. And for the range, that's going to be all outputs or all y values that are used. Now, how do we get these from the graph? Well, you'll note if I have my graph, I pick a random point and just call it x comma y x corresponds to a point on the x-axis, the y corresponds to a point on the y-axis, and I get to each just by moving along a vertical line for the x's, a horizontal line for the y's. And so that can give us a process for getting the domain and range from a graph. For the domain, we want to use all vertical lines that actually cut the graph, and then for the range, we'll use all horizontal lines. How do we implement this? So this is how I do the bookkeeping. You may find better things out there. So let's take this graph here. This passes the vertical line test, so it's definitely a function. If I want the domain, I want all x values that are used or all vertical lines that hit the graph. So if I look at vertical lines, nothing actually happens till we get to x equal to zero. And then we're gonna have all vertical lines hitting the graph until we get to the vertical line at two. And then nothing past that. So the only x values that we actually use are between zero and two. And so that's our domain. For now, we'll leave it like that. We'll get to interval notation later on. What about the range? This you got to think about a little bit. How do the y values change? Well, if we start all the way down at negative numbers, they're below, and as they get bigger and bigger, going to zero, and then going into positive numbers, we go up. So if I want to measure the range using horizontal lines, what we'll do, we start below the graph, and then we're not going to hit anything. The first y value that I'll use is a minus one right here. We keep moving, we're gonna keep hitting the graph, and then that's gonna stop when we get to y equal to two, and then nothing. So our range is gonna be all points between, okay, y equal to minus one and two. Again, we'll come back to interval notation later on. So this is a good substitute for now. That's a simple example, so just remember, verticals go left to right, 
horizontals go from below to above. Let's try our graph from before. Same idea, if I want the domain, we're gonna use vertical lines. So there's nothing back here. We come in and then we get something when we get to the vertical line at zero. We get something up until we get the vertical line at one and then there's gonna be a gap between one and two. We keep going, once I hit two, we're gonna have vertical lines hitting everything until we get five and then nothing after that. So here there's gonna be a gap in our domain that's just fine. So the domain is going to be all points X from zero to one and from two to five. Finally, if I want the range, we want to look at Y values. So here we're going to start with horizontal lines, start below the graph and then work our way up. So for vertical lines, we're not going to have any Y values used till we get to two. So that's when we hit the graph. We'll hit everything on the graph going up until we get to three and then nothing above that. So for the range, we'll get all Y from two to three. And then later, we'll put interval notation to this.